Welcome back to the channel. So today I want to share what I learned after applying to over 400 hospital pharmacist jobs in 10 years. For those of you who don't know, I've been a pharmacist for 10 years now, a director of pharmacy for six years. So I have a lot of experience interviewing pharmacists and actually doing interviews myself. Over my 10 year career, especially initially in my career, I applied to over 400 jobs on Indeed and interviewed at least 50 pharmacists over my 10 year career. So for those who don't know, I didn't do a residency. I graduated back in 2013. And what I did was because I had no residency, it was a lot harder for me to uh, get a inpatient pharmacist position to work at a hospital. So what I did was I went for the numbers game. I massively applied to, I think 200 jobs uh, back in 2013. I would wake up every morning go on indeed.com and literally type the word pharmacist, California, and filter it um, from newest first and just literally go on the list and apply to all the jobs, right? And what I learned from applying to over 200 jobs was the ones that reached out to me were typically in less desirable areas. So in California, what's considered a less desirable area? That's gonna typically be areas up north like Eureka, Yuba City, um, areas like maybe like Stockton, Modesto, Fresno, Bakersfield, Apple Valley. Um, so kind of those more, imagine those cities where they border other states, right? So if you want to, uh, you know, become a pharmacist in the Bay Area or Los Angeles, San Diego, those are a lot more competitive because it's a lot more saturated and it's a lot more desirable of area. A lot of people are, are from those areas. So as a result, there is more demand and less supply of jobs, making it much more competitive versus if you're willing to relocate to an area like Yuba City or Eureka um, or Apple Valley for you know two or three years to get experience, then they're more willing to um, hire somebody and develop somebody who may not have a residency and is just eager and willing to learn and has the right attitude. So that was kind of my initial experience. That's exactly what I did. I um, worked at a more remote location for two years at a smaller hospital. And after two years, that's when I was able to go back and, you know, work in the larger cities like the Bay Area or Los Angeles. Because once you have, you know, a few years experience under your belt, um, it makes it a lot more easier. So anyways, so let's dive into this video. So let's talk about what I learned, right? After applying to over 400 hospital pharmacy jobs, and I'm currently a pharmacy director, so I can give a lot of perspective, a lot of experience on to what we look at. So number one is timing is key. So what I mean by that is if you apply around May to July of every year, that's when it's the most competitive. And the reason why it's the most competitive is because that's when all the pharmacy residents, they're almost done. They finish at the end of June. So right around now when I'm fil filming the video, you know, a lot of residents are finishing up, they're winding down, and they're starting to apply for jobs. <clears throat> so let's just say you apply for a hospital that has a pharmacy residency program. Most likely, those positions that are posted are going to go to the residents, assuming that they're good and assuming that they uh, want to continue working for that hospital, right? So imagine if you're applying for a hospital, Let's just make up one. Let's say Stanford. Let's say let's say Stanford has two uh, pharmacist openings around May to July, and they let's say they have six pharmacy residents. Most likely, those two jobs are going to go um, to you know two of the six pharmacy residents. So even amongst the residents, it's it's very competitive, right? You're almost competing against um, your co-residents. So as well as all the other pharmacists who want to be applying for jobs. So if you know that May, June, July are the most competitive months, if you're smart, what you would do is you would actually start applying before then. And that's what I did a lot of the times. Anytime I got a new job, I typically got hired around um, March, April, or I get hired around um, like September, October. So those times, it's usually um, not as competitive and usually when a hospital loses a pharmacist during that time, uh, they become a little more desperate because, you know, from my experience, if we lost, let's say, a graveyard pharmacist in um, March, 
then you know typically you're scrambling. The, the hospital has to rotate the current pharmacy staff to cover those graveyard shifts, which is usually seven on, seven off. And a lot of times the regular pharmacists don't like doing graveyard. You know, it's the least desirable shift. So, um, you know, if you're willing to kind of come in around that time and you don't have as much experience and you're willing to work graveyard, then, you know, most likely you have a good chance of being hired because it's less competition and it's a way to get your foot into the door. And that's what I did too, actually. So after I worked at a remote, undesirable area for two years, I actually was able to get a job in San Jose, California. And I started off at as a graveyard pharmacist where I would cover um, graveyard whenever they went on vacation. So I was typically graveyard for at least maybe eight to 10 weeks a year, unless the graveyard pharmacist went on medical leave or some type of leave, then I had to cover that graveyard position fully. So I was willing to work that schedule at the time. You know, I was younger um, and I knew that I didn't have a residency and I didn't have as much experience. So I really just wanted to um, get my foot in the door do whatever it takes and take whatever position I could get to um, just get a job in a desirable location where I could move back home, you know, live with my parents and, um, you know, save money there. So once again, remember, number one, timing is key and you want to avoid May, June, July. Um, number two is the most qualified applicant doesn't get the job. So I know this may sound very counterintuitive, but this is just based on my experience, right? For better or for worse, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? It sounds very cliche. You know, pharmacy is a very small world. So a lot of times it's very key to have relationships, right? Relationships you need to maintain when you're in pharmacy school because you never know who may be your boss. Relationships you need to maintain, um, you know, at different hospitals, right? Like I've been at multiple hospitals and I never try to burn a bridge. I always am very professional, uh, very cordial, never burn a bridge. I don't want to leave a bad blood because I know that pharmacy is such a small world, you know, especially at the management director level that, you know, your reputation starts to follow you, right? Like I was originally from Northern California was there for seven years and now I've been in Southern California for three years. And, you know, even despite that, it, it's still a small world, right? Like a lot of people know others, like if you work for, you know, a large health system like Kaiser or Sutter or Providence, you know, they have multiple sister hospitals um, in Northern California, Southern California. So it starts to become very small, right? So, you know, and it, it kind of sucks, I'll be honest, because <laughs> I, I'll be honest, I was not great at, you know, networking in pharmacy school. I, I was just very much, hey, let me just take my exams and pass. Um, even when I was a pharmacist, I um, didn't really network as much as I should have. Um, I definitely did it while I was a student without even knowing it. And the funny thing was how I networked as a student was I just would eat lunch with the pharmacist. Like, you know, we had a break room. I just would always sit in the break room and just ask about the pharmacist, like, you know, ask questions about themselves, like how long they've been a pharmacist, how they got the job, how they like the job. And just over time, like that helped really helped build the relationship. So it's very key, especially if you're like a pharmacy student, like try to eat around the pharmacist where you're doing your rotations at, because, you know, they'll be the ones vouching for you and they may be your future coworkers um, or they may be your future boss, right? Like you, you never really know. So an example of why I say the most qualified applicant doesn't always get the job is because you know, I, I've applied to multiple jobs, um, you know, recently where I have, you know, nine years of pharmacy experience. Um, at the time, I had probably five years of director experience. And, you know, you apply for the job, um, you know, a larger hospital, and they um, basically never even reach out to you, right? Like you can look at the job description and see what they want the qualifications are. So it might be we want, um, you know, whatever five years of hospital experience and maybe three years as uh, in a manager level capacity. And then for me, I have you know nine years of pharmacist experience in the hospital and five years of director experience. So I'm actually beyond the minimum qualifications and some job listings will actually list the preferred qualifications. And even then I met those preferred qualifications, right? Because I've been a uh, pharmacist uh, for a while now. So I'm, I'm pretty seasoned. And you know, you apply and, you know, typically you, you won't hear anything, right? Some um, 
hospitals, they don't even respond to, to you, right? They'll never even send you a rejection email. But typically, if you don't hear anything um, within three to four months, like just assume that you probably didn't get the job, right? And, and just kind of move on from it. Um, because sometimes they don't even give you that automated rejection email that says, thank you for applying while you're qualified. Uh, we are fortunate to have more qualified candidates. So, you know, please continue to apply, right? Like some jobs won't even do that. So just keep that in mind. But, you know, since pharmacy is a small world, you know, kind of fast forward after you don't get the job, um, you know, it's been a month, the job never reached out to you. And then you, you find out who gets the job. And, you know, the one example was this one pharmacist was only a pharmacist for like, five years. So I had four years more experience. And then they've been a manager for like one year or two years. And then they got the director of pharmacy job versus myself. I had five years of director experience. So in my mind, I'm like, how would it make sense to hire somebody who only has two years of manager experience and not even call or interview a guy who has five years experience and meets all the preferred qualifications. So unfortunately this happens a lot, right? So it, it's just kind of part of it, unfortunately. That's why I say relationships are key. Um, you literally can have less experience, less qualifications, but if you know a lot of people and you're well-connected, you can get a lot of jobs, right? Versus flip-flop flip it, you have, might have a lot of experience, but you don't know anybody, you'll have a hard time getting a job. So unfortunately, it's unfair. You know, I don't necessarily agree with it. Like if a candidate, you know, meets all the preferred qualifications, I think at least a you know, a, a phone interview is, is probably appropriate. And if, you know, they have someone they want already, then so be it. Right. But it, it, it just a little bit too obvious if somebody who meets the preferred qualifications doesn't even get a call. Right. Like, you know, I, I I've even tested it and applied to jobs that I'm way overqualified for. And even then I don't, I don't get the call. So it's just kind of shows that, you know, they, they probably already have someone in mind already. Um, someone that they know already and, they're just being efficient. So just because you, like I said, me out of the qualifications doesn't mean you always get the job. So that's lesson number two. Um, lesson number three is if hiring, if the hospital is hiring multiple pharmacists simultaneously, um, you don't have to be the best, but as long as you can, one of the top like three or four, depending on how many jobs they have. So this is actually good, right? So let's just say a large hospital wants to hire one pharmacist. What happens is you have over you know 200 300 pharmacists applying to it especially if you're in a very you know competitive area like los angeles or orange county and at that point you have to be the best to get the job and oftentimes based on point number two it, they're probably gonna bring on somebody that they already know right whether it's they're promoting someone internally uh, maybe they're going from pharmacist to a manager or manager to director or they this person has a prior relationship with whoever the hiring director or manager is Right? Maybe they knew the director from a, a prior role and they're, they're, they're coming on board. So, you know, obviously it makes it harder, but let's just say that same hospital is hiring, let's say four pharmacist positions. Well, maybe the, you know, first two positions might go to people internally. And then now there's two positions where um, you actually have a shot, right? So, so you, you can apply to it. So, you know, from my experience, if, you know, it sounds obvious, but if they have multiple pharmacy positions simultaneously you know i've been on the other end where i have to hire like three positions you kind of get tired of doing interviews right it's it's very draining uh they all start to sound the same i'll be honest and um it gets repetitive so you just kind of want to get over it right like this is kind of the perspective of the pharmacy director which i've been like you just want to hey you know we got our top two we still got two more to hire let's just pick two who you know, maybe in other circumstances we have, we have not taken, but, you know, given that we need to hire four positions fast, then, um, you know, we just want to fill these positions. So this is a great time where, you know, maybe you don't have any connections and maybe you don't have the greatest qualifications yet. So this is when you kind of pounce and you can see it right on the job posting on Indeed. I'll say that oh, we're hiring multiple candidates. So usually those positions um, would be easier because to me, it's easier to be like in the top four versus to be the best one, right? So you just increase your odds and then um, it increases your chances because the people who have connections and relationships will get hired first and then there's still leftover positions uh, for the rest. Um, the next point, the fourth point is, you know, don't take rejection personally. So, you know, like I said, I've been a director for six years, uh, pharmacist for 10 years, I don't have a residency. 
you know, a lot of people would say, wow, that's really impressive, but I've probably been rejected the most, right? Like I applied to over uh, 400 jobs and, you know, over a 10 year career. So, so that means that, you know, the majority, I, I'd probably say at least 390 out of 400 were all rejections, right? And a lot of those rejections came for jobs where I met the preferred qualifications for, and they never even contacted me, never even interviewed me and all that, right? So it's really um, a lot is out of your control. Like when you apply to these jobs, like you don't know what's going on internally, right? Like you don't know what's going on. Like maybe they have an internal candidate they want to hire, right? Like right now, if you apply in June or July or May, like if there's a position posted and they have a residency program, like you can apply, but there's a good chance that their that position is probably for one of their pharmacy residents that they um, – you know, want to hire and bring on because, you know, they've been there for a year and they developed this pharmacist over the past year and, and they want to give them opportunity, right? So it doesn't mean that you're not qualified. It's just that they have someone internal already that they made their mind on. They just have to post a position to make it seem like they're, um, you know, trying to fish for other candidates or maybe that resident or internal candidate may not take it, right? So they need some, some backup options. So like once I kind of learned that, I, I never... Uh, take it personally anymore but definitely initially i did kind of take it personally i'm like why you know i've put in all this work all this time got this experience you know for me on, on top of my 10 years I, I have a master's degree i have multiple certifications um and even despite that I'm, I'm, I'm you get beat by people who have less qualifications um less skill but they're internal and they have relationships right so you know, don't take rejection personally. Like I said, I've been through a lot. You know, I've even done jobs where you do the interview and you get rejected. Um, like I remember one job I applied for, I, I had a three day interview and it was three full eight hour days, right? It was like massive panel interviews, very exhausting. I went through all that and then you, know, you don't get the job. And then you find out that the person who did get the job had less experience than you, but maybe. Um, that candidate just had a better vibe or energy with, you know, that team, or maybe it was someone they knew already. Right. So it's a lot of, out of your control. So, you know, don't take it rejection personally. All you can do is, um, you know, continue applying, right? Like don't let it get you down and keep on applying and eventually the right opportunity will come up. Um, the, so point number four is, you know, don't take rejection personally. Um, number five is, you know, a residency isn't required. Like I know, especially me, like I thought coming out of pharmacy school that they really ingrained to you that like in order to get a hospital job, you need to do a pharmacy residency. And, you know, it definitely is true. Like if you do a pharmacy residency, um, it does make you more competitive. Um, only downside is, you know, you're, you're kind of competing against all the pharmacy residents for the same jobs at the same time, right? That's May, June, July. So it is a little more competitive, but, you know, obviously if the hospital you're doing a residency at has a job position, it makes it very easy for you to apply and get that job because if they, assuming they like you, right, they may not like you either and don't want you at all. So, you know, it, it it's definitely helpful. It definitely develops you clinically. It definitely helps you think um, more critically. And, you know, it's basically once in a lifetime experience, right? So, you know, if you have the means, by all means do it, but... You know, for some people, which includes myself, um, you know, residency um, actually never came across my mind. Like, I just thought, like, why would I want to get paid less for a year to apply for a job? And the point of the residency was to get a job when I just can try to get the job myself, right? So that was kind of my mindset. And, you know, I'm more of like a hands-on learner where I need to be doing the actual thing. And then from there, I'll just learn organically, right? So I'm a very hands-on learner. Um, and I know that if given enough time, I can learn it, right? But if maybe you're not as you know confident like that, and you want that additional year, it's definitely beneficial, right? It's definitely beneficial in giving you confidence and in prepping you to become a you know a strong clinical pharmacist. So, you know, from my experience though, over the past ten years of being a pharmacist, six years of director, you know, the the residency, I think it helps you get a job initially. But honestly, it, it's not really looked upon as much once you have over three years of inpatient experience, right? So when I'm hiring candidates right now, you know, if they're like a new grad, fresh residency, I kind of know what to expect, right? You know, maybe they, they have a decent baseline clinically. 
Um, they can critically think, but maybe operationally, they, they may not be as strong depending on how much staffing they've done. Um, sometimes residents will staff like, you know, once or twice a month. Some hospitals might make you do it four times a month. So obviously, if you staff more times, then you're going to have more strong operation experience. Or some programs focus on clinical, so they don't, they're really strong clinically, but operationally not as sound, right? So that's what I typically know I'm going to get out of a pharmacy resident who just finished. You know, very clinically strong, can critically think, but may operationally may not be as sound yet, right? It takes about two years to get really comfortable, you know, being an inpatient pharmacist. And, um, you know, so once you kind of, so if you kind of have a candidate where have, they have a residency versus somebody who has maybe, you know, four years of experience about a residency, at that point, it's almost kind of even, you know, it depends on the role. Obviously, if it's a very specialized clinical role, like a ICU pharmacist, ED pharmacist, you know, first and second year residency helps a lot. But if there's a pharmacist who's been staffing ICU for, you know, six, seven years, and they don't have a residency, and they've been doing it for a while, like they may be just as qualified, right? So, um, you know, some hospitals consider residency as three years of experience. I, I'm kind of 50-50 about that because, like I said earlier, um, the residents, when they finish, they're very strong clinically. I'd say it's three years of clinical experience, but in terms of operation, uh, they will not know more than a pharmacist who's been working operationally for three years in a hospital, right? I mean, not to say they can't learn it, but it's they're not going to be three years of operational experience. It'll be three years of clinical experience um, for that. And, you know, to me... Um, you know, residency isn't required if, if you're willing to relocate, right? So that's what I did. Like I, for some people, residency may not make sense, right? Whether, because they can't afford to take the huge pay cut. So for those who don't know, residents make around 50K um, salary. And, you know, starting pharmacists, uh, depending on which region, is at least 120,000 to 170,000, depending on like what region you're at. But, you know, resident salary is one one half to one third of the typical pharmacist salary. And to pay in your situation, if you have, if you have kids, you have a family, uh, you need to start your pharmacy career a bit later, um, it may not make sense to like take a pay cut and you have to start making money immediately to provide support for your family, right? So in that case, it doesn't make sense. Or maybe um, you, you live somewhere, you have a house somewhere and locationally, you cannot <clears throat> be as flexible. So it may, resi won't make sense in, in that case. So, you know, if, if you're willing to relocate, like me, I was really young when I graduated from pharmacy school in my early 20s. Um, you know, obviously, I, I preferred to be in the Bay Area where I was from, but I knew that, you know, I, I applied to a bunch of Bay Area jobs and I knew, like, no one really reached out to me. And I think out of the 200 jobs I applied to back then in 2013, like, maybe 10 people reached out to me for an interview. Um you know, phone interview. And then out of those 10, I think I got like two or three offers. So like, look at those odds, right? So 1% um, <laughs> of the jobs I applied to actually gave me an offer and 5% of the jobs I applied to actually contacted me for a phone interview. And um, based on my experience, those those 10 that reached out were in more remote areas, right? Like Bakersfield, Fresno, Stockton, where I went to school, you know, Eureka, um, kind of in the central California, um, you know, Apple Valley, uh, Paradise, just these really remote areas. And um, so, you know, if you're open to like relocating for like two to three years and, and getting that really solid experience um, and then working there, getting that experience. And then when opportunity comes in the area you want to live in, whether it's like the Bay Area or, California or Los Angeles, um, you just can start to apply like ideally around you know, not May, June, July, start applying around, avoid those times. And then uh, you have an opportunity that arises, right? Now you have experience. Now you're not brand new grad and um, you have solid years under your belts. There's a lot of good hospitals out there in more remote areas that like you'll be surprised. And um, you, know, you get the full pharmacist salary and you just gave up maybe two, three years of your life um, to get that experience, to get paid, and then you can come back to where you want to be, right? When when you apply for residency, you're not necessarily guaranteed where you want to be either, right? Like some people, I know they only want to do residency in Southern California, and if they don't get one, they just move on, right? Or some people say, I want residency no matter what, and they may be anywhere across California, right? So when you do residency, you don't know where you're going to be either, um, just like if you're willing to relocate to another area. So, you know, to kind of summarize, you know, residency isn't required. It's definitely encouraged if you're financial situation can do it and, and you're really passionate about it 
But just know that if you don't get a residency, um, it's not the end of the world. Um, just be willing to relocate to other areas and be willing to apply to over 200 jobs like me, right? So that, that was kind of my superpower was I was very tenacious and I just would apply, wake up every day and it became a numbers game, right? Like you just applied, you know, applications don't take as long as you think. It takes like maybe 15 minutes per application. But once you kind of have the application built into the site, like, you know, you just kind of apply to multiple jobs and it gets easier and easier. So, you know, once again, number five is your residency isn't really required. Um, number six is you want to apply for a job even if you feel unqualified. So I know this is a struggle um, more so with, um, you know, girls and females or women in pharmacy. Um, I think there is some statistic. I don't know the study, but they said that like for in order for a woman to apply for a job, they have to feel like they meet at least 70% of the qualifications. And a lot of times they're just even afraid to apply for the job because of fear of failure, fear of rejection, and just the stress and anxiety that goes with like applying versus like, you know, someone like me, I, I really, you know, I can apply without even batting an eye. I can be completely unqualified and just apply. And, and to me, I'm just like, Hey, it's worth a stab. Like 99% of the time they're, I'm probably not going to get it. They're probably going to not even respond. But hey, if, if I get that lucky 1% and they give me an opportunity, um, that's how you get the job. So that's kind of my mentality. But I get like a lot of people don't have that. You know, pharmacy is predominantly a woman, um, you know, in the profession. Like in my class, it was 70%, you know, female, 30% guys. That's just the typical makeup of hospital, right? Like nursing is the same thing. Um, and a lot of them are just too afraid and and I would encourage them like hey just apply like you never know what will happen right like, worst case they say no and and um you know you just keep on applying or if you're trying to leave your current job then you're just stuck at your current job which is not the end of the world right so to me it's just like if you don't apply you're basically saying that you you won't have the opportunity and you're never giving yourself the chance and just by applying and getting rejected like I learned a lot like I, I will probably create a video on how to interview um, well for a, you know, clinical pharmacist position. Um, because, you know, I've interviewed so many different pharmacists and unfortunately, like we're really terrible as pharmacists about it is because we, we struggle, um, talking about ourselves in a positive light. And, you know, I'll specifically say for like in the Asian American community, like we have a hard time, um, up talking ourselves and we're taught to be humble. You can't really brag about what you do. Um, you know, but it's kind of hard to uh, sell yourself a bit if, um, you know, you don't do that and you're not great at storytelling and um, you can't engage the the hiring team because like we're doing so many of these interviews, like honestly, like I've interviewed, I remember one time I'd interviewed three pharmacists in a row and honestly, they all sound exactly the same to me at the end and they didn't really leave a lasting impression. They, they were just giving very, you know, generic answers, very, um, I call them like graduation speech answers, like, oh, thank you for the time and opportunity. Oh, this is what I've done. I care about patients. Like it just sounds very like cookie cutter generic. Um, so I probably will create a video on, on how to interview for a, a clinical pharmacist position because I feel like so many pharmacists, they're very terrible at interviewing, but they're actually good at the job, right? <laughs> Great at the job, terrible interviewing. And I think it's just because, you know, pharmacists, we're, we're introverted by nature. Uh, number two is we're very detail oriented. And, and number three is, you know, we try to be perfectionist. So, you know, definitely we'll create a video on that. Um, but, you know, the point of number six was just apply for the job if you're unqualified. You know, worst case is no, you wasted like 15 minutes of your time, right? But um, best case is, um, hey, you might get another opportunity. So this is like asymmetrical risk, right? Like the reward could be great if you actually get the job. It's an amazing opportunity. The risk is, the downside is, okay, you applied, you wasted some time. Maybe you felt embarrassed and then... You're just at your current job. So, you know, it's 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 not the end of the, the world um, there. So um, a, a kind of another point that I want to hit is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's just a numbers game. Like, you know, applying for jobs, you just have to, it's a numbers game. You just have to be patient, you know, right time, right place. And there's a lot of... Um, you know, jobs where I'll see it posted and then literally you apply and then the next day you get rejected immediately. At that point, you know that it's someone internal, right? Like I remember a year ago, 
um, when I was unemployed and got laid off from the hospital. Um, you know, I remember applying for this job and I, I definitely met all the preferred qualifications. And literally the next day I sent a rejection email. And then all of a sudden that position was taken off for the hospital. The director of pharmacy position was taken off the hospital. And all of a sudden I see a posted uh, pharmacy manager position. So what, what does that kind of tell you? It tells you that they already had that position posted for someone internal. So they wanted to prom promote the um, manager to director. And then I saw the manager position, so I applied to that, right? Because I was unemployed. And then same thing, I got the rejection email the next day. And then all of a sudden that position is gone. And now I see a pharmacist position open. So once again, they promoted a pharmacist internally to manager and the manager was promoted internally to director, right? So it's it's really out of your control. It doesn't mean that you're not qualified. Um, and, you know, it. the more you do it, the better you get, right? Because I've applied to so many jobs because I've done so many phone interviews because I've done so many pharmacist interviews and interviewed pharmacists. It, it just really helped me hone on how to interview um, and help me improve myself and really get to network with people as well. Right. Cause when you go there, you get to meet the you know director of pharmacy or, or the hiring manager and pharmacist is a small world. So like maybe it doesn't work out this time, but who knows, maybe, you know, three to five years down the road, it, it may lead to something. So you know, it's just a numbers game and, and don't feel bad. So to kind of summarize, um, you know, what I learned kind of applying to a 400 hospital pharmacy jobs is number one, you know, timing is key. You want to avoid May, June, July. Number two is the most qualified applicant doesn't always get the job. Remember, for better or worse, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Relationships are very key. So just because you're quali very qualified and you don't have the relationships, you may not even get called, right? Just, it's unfortunate, but that's just my, been my experience. Um, if they're hiring multiple pharmacists, it, um, it increases your chance. That's number four. Number five is don't take rejection personally. Like I said, a lot of times, a lot of things are out of your control. It could be someone internal. Number six is a residency is not required, but definitely recommended. Um, number seven is apply for jobs, even if you feel unqualified. Um, remember, the worst case is no, and you wasted some time. And number... Eight is, it's just a numbers game. The more you apply, the more you learn, the more opportunities will come to you. So overall, um, hope you found value in this video and hope to see you in the next one. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.